a remote cliff top, a fatal fall. Des Campbell's wife is dead. He claimed it was a tragic accident. I didn't do anything. But this was cold-blooded murder. I had no doubt in my mind whatsoever that he pushed her off the cliff. The conniving gold digger. Very selfish, cold, nasty person. Who only married for one thing, money. He just got cocky. And she preyed on lonely men. Very cold, callous, calculating, completely motivated by greed. Men looking for love. He was a good person. It's very easy to like. But for George Marsetta... It's alleged that you placed the drug in George Marsetta's food that evening. That's an accusation and a half of anything is an accusation. There was no happy ever after. Hello, I'm Leila McKinnon. Welcome to Inside Story. They were lonely people looking for love. The perfect targets for the despicable predators you'll meet tonight. Gold diggers who weaseled their way into the hearts and bank accounts of two unsuspecting, vulnerable people. It wasn't the first time they'd done it, but they just got greedier and greedier. They wanted it all. And to get it, they had to kill. It was the most unlikely place to go camping, perched on the edge of a 54-metre cliff. But Des Campbell didn't come here for the scenery. He came here to murder his new wife, Janet. The story was that she had slipped and, and fallen over the cliff. Did you believe that for a while? No, no, not never, no. Did you have anything to do with the death of Janet? I did. I was mad I did a fucking year camping. But I didn't do anything. As we'll see tonight, police didn't believe a word of Campbell's pathetic act. But this ruthless bloodsucker was free to prey on unsuspecting women for another three years. His first question was, um, what's your portfolio? How much you got in shares? How much you got in this and that? Des Campbell was a serial womaniser. He'd already been married twice when he met Janet Fisicaro, and he had dumped yet another woman before they even made it to the altar. Then there were countless flings and dalliances. But when Campbell met Janet Fisicaro, he knew he was on a winner. Janet was a lovely lady, but she did not seem the type that Des would be attracted to. But Janet was exactly what Des was looking for, a naive, unworldly, wealthy farm widow looking for love. Des stood to gain more than half a million dollars. All he had to do was woo her, marry her, get her to change her will and murder her. I always thought that he was going to hurt her. No, I just thought he'd rip her off. I just knew he was mm. after her money. But Des had greatly underestimated one obstacle, Janet's loving family, who saw him for what he really was, a cruel, philandering gold digger. Bloody family were interfering pricks in their marriage. Just from the beginning, I just didn't like him. First thing I thought is he just didn't seem Jenny's type. All he wanted to do was rip her off, and you could see it a mile away. Also tonight, Vicky Afandis, the hired help who stole the heart of an older man, then murdered him so she could steal his money. What is your reason for murdering George Marcetta? I won't comment because I didn't do it. I put it to you. As Who's result? making all these um, allegations? Me. Oh. Just like Des Campbell, it wasn't the first time Vicky Afandis had preyed on the vulnerable. But this time, she was determined to get everything. And the trust in George Marsetta happily allowed Vicky to take control of every aspect of his life. From all accounts, George was head over heels in love with Vicky and he would do anything for her. He just uh, did whatever she wanted. What Afandis really wanted was to get rid of George Marsetta and keep his house, his money, and his business to quite literally take him to the cleaners. One evening, she drugged his meal, poured kerosene around the house he had already signed over to her, then set it alight. It's alleged that you placed the drug in George Marcetta's food that evening. What do you say to that? That I placed... Oh! 
Why would I? Oh, no, no, no. Why would I do that? I'd... No comment. Jesus, that's an accusation and a half, if anything, is an accusation. She was such a good con woman that um, on the day we interviewed her, I had a policewoman um, escort her around and be with her for the day. And at the end of the day, after I'd finished my interview, she said, look, you've got the wrong person. This woman's beautiful. She's a lovely lady. But first, Des Campbell, the former paratrooper who pushed his wife Janet over a cliff so he could claim her fortune. They'd only been married six months when Janet plunged to her death. Des claimed it was a tragic accident, that she must have fallen after leaving the tent to go to the toilet. And I heard what sounded like a, uh, 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 almost like a sigh. And, and I think I said, what the fuck have you done now? And there was no reply. And the story that Janet had got up in the night to go to the bathroom and, and tumbled over the edge, well, what did the site tell you about that? Well, the, the, the tent was pitched facing, um, obviously facing the water. It was very easy to see that, um, that there was a cliff in front of you. So I can't think of any circumstances where you would leave that tent knowing there's a cliff there and accidentally fall off. So the story didn't ring true from the word go? Oh, not at all. Daniloquin, country New South Wales. It was known as the Ute capital of the world until paramedic Des Campbell put it on the map for something far more sinister. It was here at work that Des found the perfect victim, hospital assistant and wealthy widow Janet. Ever the predator, Des moved in. But this time he would leave no loose ends. He would marry and murder her. How would you describe Jenny? Friendly, thoughtful, and she was so harmless, she wouldn't hurt a fly. She was just there to do anything for anyone. Mary Marshall and Therese Rourke tried to warn their sister off the money-grabbing predator, but she wouldn't be swayed. Janet, or Jenny as they called her, was smitten. He's obviously said the right things, pushed the right buttons, done all of that, that she just became... She was infatuated by him. She was, you know, to Jenny, she was in love and, and she'd found her new man. How would you describe your relationship with each other? Good. Yeah. Have you have you ever had any marital problems? Oh, no more than a, a couple of angry words. I suppose that's about it. Yeah. But Des Campbell despised Janet and spoke of her in cruel and disparaging terms, even after he married her. Well, he just said that she was a fat, ugly pig and she won't leave him alone and, and that sort of thing. So as if she was just some woman who was obsessed with him? Yeah, that's right. When in fact she was his wife? That's correct. Uh, initially, um, came across as a quite a nice guy. Um, competent in his job, um, you know, friendly. Um, then he started to sort of show some, some strangers, you know, stranger uh, attitudes. Bob Crampton was Campbell's boss at the local ambulance station. I say I, I had no doubt that Des would end up with every penny that, that Janet had. You know, I, I never thought you know, there'd be murder involved, but as soon as I heard that it happened, I, say I had no doubt in my mind whatsoever that he'd pushed her off the cliff. Coming up on Inside Story, Des Campbell's dark past. They'd often pull different races over and just make up infractions. They picked the people that wouldn't complain. Des Campbell was hardly a great catch. He had little money and an extremely shady past. Janet Fisicaro had no idea what she was getting herself into when the widower met the smooth-talking paramedic. You mentioned to me before that you, that you served as a police officer? Yes, uh, I was in the Victoria Police and the British Police. Before becoming a paramedic, Campbell was a police officer for almost 12 years, both in Australia and the UK. But it was hardly a distinguished career. He was thrown out of Victoria Police in the mid-90s after admitting to bashing confessions out of suspects and planting false evidence. You know, tell us about his time in the police force. They'd often pull um, different races over and, and uh, just make up infractions. 
um, and issue them and he said they'd sort of pick their mark so that they picked the people that wouldn't complain. After being sacked by Victoria Police, Campbell joined the British Police Force but returned home in disgrace after just three years. He had attacked an innocent man with pepper spray and was facing allegations of sexual assault. While in England, Des had an affair with June Ingham. She left her husband and came to Australia to be with him. But when she told Des her divorce settlement was just $45,000, he was furious. He called her a slag and a liar, and he drove her to the airport and left her. And did they get back together? Yeah, the following day he thought about it and, uh, and rang her and they made up and he um, asked if she'd buy a a new sports car, a Lotus Esprit, for $60,000. And she did? She did. The couple got engaged and bought a house in Daniloquin with June's money. Campbell suggested the house be in his name as June wasn't a resident. After nine months, she returned to England to pack up her life and ship her belongings to Australia, ready to become the new Mrs Des Campbell. He told us when she went back to England that she was um, spending hugely on his credit cards and he basically rang her up and told her, you know, that was, it was all over. In fact, Des broke up with June by text, saying, I'm sorry, but I am moving to live with ex-wife. We'll sell house and send you money. Post me address for your things to be sent to you. Have made up my mind to do this. We were sort of a bit taken back when we found out the truth later that it was actually him that had bled her dry. Campbell returned one photo album and refused further contact with June. As for paying her back, he gave her a measly $9,000, but only after June took him to court. Meanwhile, the serial sleazebag continued to pursue women online. He was an absolutely beautiful man. He just absolutely amazed me. He was just a really, really good man. Jeanette Aldred was just one of several women Des Campbell met online. When I very first met him, we had the candles and, and all that sort of stuff. He wasn't into going to the pub and drinking beer with the other yobos that drink with two hands. And that was exactly how I saw him. So he was romantic? Oh, extremely. We, we sat and we watched music videos. The first one we watched was George Michael. What were you there for? sex. To be perfectly blunt and to be perfectly honest, the only reason I was there was for company and sex. And you never saw a bad side to him? Never. Des Campbell met Janet Fisicaro in 2000 at the Daniloquin Hospital where she worked as an orderly. They began dating in 2003 and from the start, Mary Marshall and Therese Rourke were wary of their sister's new man. Janet was normally very chatty, often oversharing information, yet she hardly talked about Des. And when they finally decided to marry, the secretive couple told nobody except the celebrant. He's the one who wanted it to be a secret because it was so much not, not our sister to keep anything a secret like that. She wasn't good at keeping secrets. He really didn't want the world knowing that he was going out with Jenny because she wasn't really the type of person that he would normally choose to go out with. Echuca. This is where Des Campbell and Janet Fisicaro were married. It's only an hour's drive from Daniloquin, but that was far enough away to keep the wedding a total secret. I turned up to conduct the wedding and there was Des, Janet and myself. The owner of the River Gallery Inn was asked to be a witness and her accountant, and yet Des had ordered from a local deli platters and platters of food, um, and he had bottles and bottles of French champagne. It was like he was trying to impress us, the people you know that were at the wedding, but we were just hide help and bystanders. Jennifer Whelan was the marriage celebrant at Des and Janet's wedding in September 2004. It was a great wedding. It was beautiful. Janet was happy. She looked gorgeous. Des had gone to a lot of trouble and a lot of expense. But it was also weird. What was weird? There were no cameras, no photographs. 
Had you ever been to a wedding before where photos weren't taken? No. This was an absolute first. Just as weird was Des Campbell's insistence Janet couldn't have any family, even her son Stephen, at the wedding. But she was so besotted she would agree to do anything to keep her man happy. I said, oh, so when are you going to tell the family, when are you going to break it to Stephen that you're married? And she just looked so sad that I didn't continue. By now, Des Campbell had total control over Janet. He convinced her to buy a $650,000 house eight hours away from Daniloquin at a coastal hamlet called Otford. It was to be their marital home. But Campbell was restless. While Janet wound up her affairs in the bush, he moved to Otford alone, using the bush hideaway to entertain other women. You stayed with Des at the home. Otford. Otford. Yes. Can you remember what he told you about his new home? He said that he'd bought it. He showed me the, um, the real estate magazines and, and all that sort of stuff. And it was an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous place. Did he ever mention Janet? No. Des Campbell's plan to murder his wife, Janet, was about to become a reality. Finally, she was moving up from Daniloquin to enjoy married life with her new husband in their new home. Or so she thought. I left his house three days before she moved over into the new house. Three days after that, she was dead. I figure if I'd had have parted money to him, maybe I would have been the one at the bottom of that cliff. Coming up on Inside Story, a family's fears. Mum said he will do something. This is where he will do something to her. As the killer strikes. In September 2004, Des Campbell married Janet Fisicaro. Not long after, she rewrote her will, adding her husband as a major beneficiary. It was an act of trust and love that sealed Janet's fate. All Des had to do now was kill her. And as long as he made it look like an accident, he could rightfully claim Janet's fortune. Did he target your sister for her money? Yes. From the beginning? I'd say from the beginning. For six months, the newlyweds lived separately. But now Janet was leaving Daniloquin to live with Des just south of Sydney in the $650,000 house she had paid for. As I ran into Janet in the supermarket uh, just a couple of days before she, she left for Helensburg. was very excited. In fact, it was the most excited and happy that I'd ever seen Janet in my life. But within a week, Janet would be dead. A few days after arriving at their new home, Janet rang her mum, saying she and Des were going camping for a night at the nearby Royal National Park. Janet's mum, who has since passed away, suspected the worst. Oh, well, mum was really upset because mum said he will do something. This is where he'll do something to her. I know he's going to do something. It was Easter 2005 and Des had been planning this camping trip for months. They could have stayed at a campsite just one kilometre away. They could have parked an hour's walk from here. Instead, Des made Janet traipse through the Royal National Park for more than three hours. Knowing she would be tired and making it seem like he was doing her a favour by pitching their tent right here. What made you decide to go and camp here this time? Well, I was going to go to Burning Palms or somewhere up there, but Janet was sort of complaining all the time about being tired. Did she like to go camping? Had never been camping in her life, hated it. So it was out of character for her to Very go camping? Much. She wasn't an active person, mm. a sporty person, so not only did she go camping, but she went hiking for three hours mm. to get to her campsite, which didn't make any sense at all either. No. The suspicions and fears of Janet's family were well founded. Within hours, she was at the bottom of the cliff, dead. Did you have anything to do with the death of Janet? I did. I was my idea to fucking go camping. But I didn't do anything about what you mean, you know? 
Des claimed Janet left their tent at dusk to go to the toilet and she must have slipped and fallen over the edge of the 54 metre cliff. I remember going over to the, the edge as far as I could, had a couple of spots and trying to look, but I couldn't see anything. I went back to my backpack, I, that's where I had my torch. Did you, did you make, a, make an assessment of her injuries when you first... I could tell she was dead. Des Campbell's callous behaviour that night and in the following weeks astounded everyone, especially Janet's grieving family. It was only when he was at the hospital they asked if there was anyone else that should be contacted that he said, oh, well, she has got a son. In Denilquin? Somewhere. And to this day, he still hasn't told us, has he? Des has never actually said anything, no. never contacted the family, has never spoken to us, nothing. Not even a card or a letter or, or any, any acknowledgement at all. It's not the behaviour of an innocent person. It certainly isn't, no. Do you believe that Janet may have taken her own life? No. No, she wouldn't have taken her life. Right, I'm, I'm sorry to ask you that question. <laughs> but police weren't buying Des Campbell's sob story and it seemed there was only one person who believed he was innocent, his lover, Jeanette Aldred. When the police told you that Des had murdered his wife, why didn't you believe them? For starters, because I didn't believe that he was married. That was, that was the whole thing. I had this thing in my head that you mustn't have the same man because Des is not married. And did you then think oh, well, he might be married, but he wouldn't murder anybody. Well, I'm thinking, you know, he's, he's a man that goes out and saves people's lives. He's a paramedic. How, how can a paramedic go out and kill people? Does she have any, um, any savings, you know? Oh, well, she would have had some super, I suppose, 30 or 40,000, probably. At what point did police first start to suspect Des? Um... Well, obviously there were some suspicions just upon attending the, crime, the, the scene of where it occurred and, and the, where they'd pitched the tent. But um, I think as we dug deeper and deeper into his past and the way he continued into the future after Janet's death, um, it was highly suspicious. But despite the suspicions of police, Des Campbell seemed remarkably unfazed. Immediately after murdering Janet, Campbell made inquiries about her will and looked into selling the Otford house. He also went on holiday with another woman, claiming she was his wife. How did you feel about that? Well, we actually thought it was a, just a big joke. We thought, what an idiot, you know, who does he, what's he trying to prove, you know? If you're going to um, murder your wife, you could at least pretend of some sort of innocence. Des Campbell didn't let up. He was cagey, cold and uncooperative. It wasn't until two years after Janet Campbell's death, a coronial inquest was finally held to establish whether her husband should face trial for murder. Cocky as ever, the killer struck a pose for the waiting media, while his new Filipino wife, Melissa, wife number four, was about to receive the shock of her life. Not only did her husband have a third wife named Janet, he was a suspect in her death. What had Des told his fourth wife about Janet? Nothing. She didn't know anything about her? No. So she didn't know how she died? No, she wasn't aware of the circumstances on how Janet had died or what the relationship was. Even though the police case was based entirely on circumstantial evidence, the coroner recommended that Des Campbell should stand trial. And in May 2010, the philandering gold digger was finally convicted of murdering Janet six years after he pushed her off the remote clifftop south of Sydney. <laughs> Janet's family was ecstatic. This was the news they'd been waiting for. As they celebrated, Campbell was led away to serve his sentence, 33 years with a non-parole period of 24 years. Were you concerned he would get away with murder? Oh, for sure, for sure. You know, no one saw him do it. Everything was circumstantial, but there was so much evidence that, you know, 
It wasn't until they said guilty that we were, we were actually relieved. Still to come on Inside Story, the hired help... Doing the washing, cleaning, everything. ...turns homicidal. She came across as a very kind, nice lady, but deep down she's really just a callous, cold-hearted killer. The evil housekeeper who thought she'd clean up. Vicky Afandis was a real piece of work, cunning and ruthless. But she could be charming, and she used her charm well, worming her way into the lives of trusting people she cheated without hesitation. It was all pretty small time, but when Afandis met successful divorcee George Marcetta, she knew she had hit pay dirt. Soon, the manipulative housekeeper had stolen Marcetta's heart and taken control of his business. But that wasn't all she would take. Vicky Afandis portrayed herself as a kind, caring person. But she was a self-absorbed gold digger, a ruthless opportunist who preyed on older, lonely men. To Vicky, they were merely a source of income. It was all about the money. And to get it, she was even willing to murder. She came across as a very uh, kind, nice lady, but deep down she's really just a callous, cold-hearted killer. She was very money-hungry all the time, very uh, business-like in all of her dealings with people. She didn't really care about any person. She just sort of, everything she did had a purpose. Vicky had already milked two older men of their hard-earned savings when she met George Marcetta. George was in his mid-50s and ran a successful painting company when he employed 44-year-old Afandis to cook and clean for him. I was going there uh, doing the washing, cleaning, everything, because someone, you know, like, men don't do everything, you know. Vicky was also claiming a disability pension, supposedly unable to work after a number of car accidents. But she had done her homework on George, and this was an opportunity she couldn't miss. So before she even began a relationship, she had inquired she about had what he had. She had researched him, yeah. She actually went and visited his ex-wife and done a lot of research on him about his financial position and who had claim to his assets if, something, if she was to do something with him or actual words to the ex-wife. Vicky soon took control of George's entire life and no longer was she simply the hired help. Was it a sexual relationship? Yes. Or it was? Well, all sexual, it was business. But we, no, we were just like a couple. Was he happy to have a new girlfriend? Oh, yeah. He was actually uh, showing off with uh, uh, her photo on, the, on his mobile. Do you think he was in love with her? Yeah, yeah. He never actually spoke uh, about... Um, Anybody, like he was talking about um, Vicky at the time. I reckon he really loved that woman. Shop fitter Predrag Mikic met George Marcetta through work. Both born in Serbia, the men formed a solid bond. Predrag was surprised George fell for such a bossy woman, but was glad his friend of 15 years was happy. He was a good person. It's a very, uh, I reckon, very easy to like. It was very funny. Bit of a prankster. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he was a, you know, like sort of big man, like a, you know, like a teddy bear, but deep down, soft, like a cotton. And that was just how Vicky Afandis liked her men. Soft, easily manipulated. Before George Marcetta, she'd fleeced two other vulnerable divorcees. She had three ex-partners, all by the name of George. We call them George one, two and three, to make it easier. Uh, George one, she fell pregnant to him very quickly and then soon after the baby was born she left him and went on with George number two. So she had a daughter to George number one who paid child support but he was never really certain that he was the father? No, he approached Vicky and asked for a DNA test to prove that or disprove that he was the father and she wouldn't allow it to happen. When George number one refused to pay Vicky's daughter's school no fees, idea. he didn't hear from her again. George number two took on the role as the father. George number two took on the role from basically the moment the child was born and look, it's possible that he was the father, we don't know. George number two is taxi driver George Lakisiotis. Vicky took up with him in 1985 and they've had an on, off, mostly on relationship to this day. 
But when you met George Marcetta, you were still in a relationship with George Lukisiotis, a taxi driver. When I met George Marcetta, I was not in a relationship with George Marcetta. I was finishing a relationship off with George Lukisiotis. George Marcetta may have been George number three, but George Lukisiotis, the taxi driver, was far from gone. Even though he'd paid Vicky a settlement of $120,000, he was still seeing her on the sly. But she said she'd soon be back to look after him, and with all of George Marcetta's money. And within a couple of short years, Vicky Afandis had persuaded George Marcetta to sign over all his major assets, even his beloved Jaguar. When Vicky met George, he had a house in Dandenong. Vicky convinced George to sell that house and move over closer to, to where she was. Did they live together? They never lived together. Vicky convinced George to buy this house over in Belfield, which is a short distance from where she lived in Ivanhoe. The couple bought George's new Belfield house together. He contributed $100,000 and Vicky $80,000. But she demanded the house be solely in her name. He told me that she insists the house to be under her name. I mean, if you're planning to live with somebody, I kind of understand why. Vicky Afandis had the house, and now she took control of George's business. She convinced him to shut down his existing company, Universe Painting Services, and reopen it as Universal High Tech. Vicky was appointed co-director and her teenage daughter, company secretary. It was not my idea, that was his, that were you, if you'll surrender to tell you, it's not my idea at all. He wanted to just change the name. He wanted me to be in the business. In what capacity? As his partner, as his, um, like, he wanted me to be in the business. How can I say it to you? Just to well, what was your official title in the business? He was director and I was director. That's it. But Vicky wasn't interested in building a future with George Marcetta. She wanted to kill him and take over his estate. So she decided to drug him and set fire to the Belfield house with George inside. Then the insurance money would be all hers. But there was one final hurdle. She had to get George to cancel his will, which left his estate to his daughter, Athanasia. But it's here that you convinced George Marcetta, Marcetta to cancel his last will and testament, of which George Marcetta's daughter was the sole beneficiary. What do you say to that? That I told him to cancel? No. Well, why did that occur? George had a fight with his daughter. They, they weren't talking. George had a fantastic relationship with his daughter. His daughter's a, a lovely, gentle person, as George was. He's a very happy, gentle person. So Vicky fabricated a family rift between George yeah. and his daughter. It was all to do with this will. She, she wanted him to cancel his will. Next on Inside Story, how Vicky's shocking crime comes unstuck. No one had told you that there was a deceased person in the house. You're saying that Ivan Bassett has murdered George Marcetta. What do you say to that? George Marcetta was a marked man. His scheming lover, Vicky Afandis, had taken control of his assets, of his entire life. Now all she had to do was kill him and she'd inherit the lot. But first Vicky needed a fall guy, and that fall guy was one of George's friends, Ivan Bassett. You did make a report to police, is that correct? In relation to a burglary? Vicky tried to frame Bassett to make out there was bad blood between him and George by staging a fake robbery at George's house, then blaming his mate. Do you agree that that uh, burglary did not in fact occur? No, I didn't say that. No, I'm asking. The, that the burglar didn't occur. She said that she'd seen Ivan Bassett driving away with a trailer uh, full of George Marcetta's tools and, and she'd actually physically seen him leave the crime scene. Having cast suspicion on Ivan Bassett, Vicky put her plan to murder George into action. On the 8th of September 2004, she tidied up the house, then cooked George his favourite meal, pork rolls and noodles, heavily lacing it with the sedative Serapax. The post-mortem results indicate that George Marcetta ingested this drug with mm -hmm. his last meal. Do you have any comment to make about that? His last meal, how would he do that? How would he do that? Vicky later told police she went home after cooking the meal and texted George goodnight.
She claimed that after he replied, she went to bed at about 11.30. But she was lying. She was actually at George's home and she sent and received both text messages. George was incapable of anything. He was in bed, unconscious. Vicky now prepared to burn him alive. Clean, but I'll put it to you that in preparation to burn the house and murder George Marcetta, you've spread newspaper throughout the floor. What do you say to that? I'm not going to comment on, 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 on accusations like that, no. I'm not going to comment. If I didn't do something like that, Jesus. No. Well, did you do that? No, I deny it. Vicky then drove home and got into bed. At about 3 a.m., she received a call from one of George's neighbours and returned to the burning house. Vicky told police at the scene that George's mate, Ivan, had murdered him. It was a monumental mistake. No one had told you that there was a deceased person in the house at that time when you were saying that Ivan Bassett has murdered George Marcella. What do you say to that? I don't understand it. I don't understand. Well, why would you be saying that Ivan Bassett killed George Marcetta before anyone's actually told you that there was a body in the house. Early the next morning, George's best mate, Pradrag Mikic, received a call from Vicky telling him the house had burnt down. She goes, George is gone. I said, where did he go? She goes, he died. I was just trying to picture George in that moment because I was very close to him. When did you next talk to Vicky? Um, the very same uh, uh, same day she called uh, the meeting. So the same day that George had died, That's she correct. called a meeting about yeah. business? Yes. Vicky's lack of emotion was deeply unsettling. Even at George's funeral, she didn't appear to be upset. My impressions were that she was just a very calculated, cold-hearted, evil person. She was just showed no remorse or no um, compassion for anyone. But while police found Vicky's behaviour highly suspicious, there was one crucial detail that had them stumped. A neighbour had spotted a late model Ford Falcon in George's driveway on the night of the fire. They needed to find the owner of that car. And we just door knocked every car hire company within a massive radius and, and come across it. Police finally found the mystery car here. Vicky, who had access to three other cars, had secretly hired it two days before the murder and returned it just hours after the fire. She even asked the attendant to rip up the rental agreement. Fortunately, they didn't, and it was to be another damning piece of evidence against Vicky Afandis. No other person other than yourself was aware that you had possession of that hire car um, from your car. What do you say to that? No one was aware. Nobody else was aware. What, what difference, what, what does that, what, what does that mean? What does it make, does it make, do I have to advertise the fact that I'm hiring a car if something gets broken down? I mean, uh, do I do, do you have to do that? I don't understand. I don't understand, I didn't conceal it, it was in the driveway. The police now had a strong case against Vicky Afandis. Detectives charged her with George Marcetta's murder. And while Vicky was in prison awaiting trial, there was another breakthrough. She confessed to fellow prisoners. I knew nothing about the murder. I don't read newspapers. I never saw anything on television. What I know came from Vicky's mouth. Anne was Vicky's cellmate at the Dame Phyllis Frost Correctional Centre, and her evidence would prove crucial at the trial. I say as well, did you do it? And she hesitated and she says, well, we done it. It was all arranged. I tried not to show her my shock, my face, because I'm thinking, my God, I'm, I'm sleeping next to a murderer. With Anne's new evidence and a compelling circumstantial case, Vicky Afandis was found guilty of George Marcetta's murder. She was sentenced to 24 years with a non-parole period of 20 years. Today, um, justice was served for my father. He was a good man, very hardworking, loved and respected by all his family. I've never uh, met anyone like Vicky Evandis in my life, never. She's, she's evil. She, she, she's not someone that can do that to a nice man because he, I've been told that he's a lovely man. He's not a human being. And for money, 
shocking. The lust for money, greed, terrible. She's where she belongs. Coming up on Inside Story, a family remembers... Beautiful, innocent person that didn't deserve anything that happened to her in the end. ...as others try to forget. He's a murderer. He's a nasty, nasty man. Vicky Afandis never showed any remorse for killing her partner, George Marcetta. In fact, she steadfastly denied she had anything to do with it. And in killing George Marcetta, I used to, to gain all of his assets. The house at 140 Liberty Parade, the business of Universe High Tech Construction and Interior, and other shadows and possessions of George Marcetta. What do you say to that? I won't comment, really. I won't comment. What is your reason for murdering George Marcetta? I won't comment because I didn't do it. She wasn't owning up to the police, but Vicky did confess to fellow prisoners as she awaited trial. Crucial evidence that finally saw her locked away for at least 20 years. Vicky's big mouth had helped get her arrested. And even here at the Dame Phyllis Frost Correctional Centre, she kept on talking, confessing to a fellow inmate that she'd been trying out drugs on George for months and saying that three people had planned the murder. She told me that she was sick of people, George lending money to other people, and it was all about Vicky and uh, control and arrogance, very arrogant. It had to be her way or the highway. Did you see her cry? No, to be honest, no. You never saw her cry once? No, honest to God, no. Just how many people fell victim to Vicky Afandis, she's not saying. But during her trial, police gave evidence about the suspicious deaths of several elderly people in her care. I would describe her, from my knowledge, of her being um, very callous, cold, calculated, manipulative, and just completely driven by greed. How do you think she felt about George Marcetta? I think George Marcetta was just a cash cow to her. But George loved her? George loved her, yes. And she abused that love. While Vicky Afandis languishes in a Victorian prison, Des Campbell is serving his sentence at Goulburn's forbidding maximum security jail. Just deserts for the man who pushed his wife off a 54 metre cliff. We spent years trying to get the answer we wanted, that he was guilty, that he was going to spend his life in jail, and that helped. We're not making it OK, but getting my sister justice, the justice she deserved, and hopefully it's helped all those women out there be safe from this man, or he would just be out there doing it still again doing it. Yep. to another woman. Des Campbell hasn't been idle in prison. He's vigorously protested his innocence to anybody who'll listen. And just last year, he appealed his conviction and lost. She was meant to start her new life, but her new life lasted less than a week. So, if only you'd turn back time where she never met Des. Be a whole different story. But he would have found someone else anyway and done the same because that's just the sort of person he is. So, evil and vicious. And even those who'd been dazzled by the con man in the past now see Des Campbell for who he truly is. Now you know what you know about Des Campbell. What do you think of him? He's a murderer. There's no two ways about it. He killed his wife. He took an awful lot of women for a ride. He took a lot of women for their money. Um, he conned them big time. He's a nasty, nasty man. And he's where he should be now. <laughs>